buonasera, buonasera a tutti, grazie per essere qui. Eh, vorrei fare io un applauso grande così a voi, a voi e anche agli amici che, sono, che non sono riusciti a entrare in questa bellissima sala eh, e, e, e appunto ci seguiranno comunque con lo streaming per la, la proiezione che abbiamo allestito in fondo uh, usando le scale meravigliose della triennale come una sorta di arena, quindi uh, sfruttiamo tutti gli spazi e tutti i modi e tutte le occasioni perché quello che a noi ci interessa è far circolare le idee, mettere sempre di più in contatto persone e idee e, e lavorare su questo... Beh, su questo tema così importante che è quello della cultura digitale, del cambiamento, dei problemi legati alla nostra società in questa grave situazione, ma anche una situazione di, di trasformazione, di cambiamento, in cui si leggono anche delle, delle, dei segnali interessanti. Allora, prima di tutto, per chi non conosce Media Media Guru, una parola, eh, è un ciclo, è un progetto che va avanti ormai da 11 anni e che in questa occasione, grazie alla Triennale di Milano, ha creato un format per particolare che è Future Ways of Living, adesso ci ritorneremo un attimo sopra, è un ciclo di incontri con personaggi che appunto stanno dentro questi temi, soprattutto io lo sintetizzo con questa espressione cultura digitale, che vuol dire? Vuol dire cercare di capire appunto quelli che sono le, i cambiamenti in atto, le modalità, l'impatto delle tecnologie nella nostra vita, che cosa si sta generando di nuovo, siamo tutti esperti o non esperti curiosi o comunque vorremmo capire e non essere presi alla sprovvista tutti questi cambiamenti e queste situazioni senza che nessuno si sappia orientare. Con Andrea Cancellato che è invito qua abbiamo appunto creato questo programma all'interno della ventunesima triennale che è tornata finalmente a Milano, quindi applausone, con questo programma Design After Design. E ed è stata un'idea di Andrea, quella di provare a lavorare insieme, e devo dire oggi, eh, grazie, <ride> è l'ultimo, e questo è l'appuntamento per Arjun Padurai, che ci, appunto, siamo qui per lui questa sera, quindi cercheremo di portarvi via pochissimo tempo, e lo riaccoglieremo dopo, eh, una parola anche ad Andrea, perché abbiamo fatto questo percorso di 5 più 2 con Branzi e Ara appuntamenti, uno più bello dell'altro, e stasera chiudiamo con il nostro, beh, facciamoglielo anche a lui, veramente un applauso forte di accoglienza, chiedo anche agli amici sotto che ci ha raggiunto Andrea. Buonasera a tutti, siamo qui per ascoltare Padurai, quindi... Pochissime parole da parte mia, si conclude questo ciclo di incontri, ci stiamo avviando anche alla conclusione della ventunesima esposizione internazionale della Triennale, ricordo a tutti, beh, sembra una barzelletta, ma che soprattutto per i milanesi che non aspettino gli ultimi giorni per andare a vedere le mostre, che sono tantissime per Milano, non solo in Triennale, come sapete abbiamo 19-20 luoghi espositivi, eh, compreso anche l'ex area Expo, dove abbiamo mostre tutte, tutte di grande interesse, poi ovviamente tutte criticabili, attorno a questo tema, ventunesimo secolo, design after design, che parte da un presupposto fondamentale, il ventunesimo secolo segna una grande discontinuità con il ventesimo secolo, ci impone riflessioni completamente nuove, sono quelle che abbiamo cominciato a fare con questi incontri, sono quelle che stiamo facendo con le mostre, con tutte le eh, attività che sono connesse appunto alla ventunesima esposizione della Triennale di Milano. Eh, ovviamente eh, continueremo a discutere, non è che poi il 12 settembre quando si smonta eh, finiremo la discussione. Terremo però conto del lavoro fatto in questi mesi, in queste settimane, degli incontri che abbiamo avuto, delle discussioni che abbiamo aperto. Abbiamo detto che non ci aspettiamo risposte, ci aspettiamo nuove domande, nuovi problemi da affrontare per il futuro. Non è ancora il momento delle risposte e tutti noi infatti ci domandiamo cosa sta succedendo nel mondo e che cosa può fare il mondo del progetto per il mondo, perché questo è il grande tema che deve affrontare il mondo del progetto, l'architettura, il design, le arti applicate, le nuove tecnologie, sono eh, questioni rilevantissime e quel poco che cominciamo a tentare di concludere rispetto ai ragionamenti che abbiamo fatto, abbiamo capito che soprattutto nel mondo occidentale 
siamo pieni di cose ma abbiamo bisogno di soluzioni e quindi il vero nodo è trovare nuove soluzioni più che nuove cose, anche nuove cose ovviamente perché non siamo mai soddisfatti di quello che abbiamo e di quello che usiamo e dobbiamo comunque sempre migliorare le prestazioni in generale di tutto ciò che noi facciamo, ma soprattutto al di là del tema del desiderio, al di là del tema appunto dell'avere nuove possibilità attraverso le cose, abbiamo la necessità di soluzioni e il mondo del progetto ne può dare tante, alcune abbiamo cominciato ad esplorarle anche con questi incontri, questa sera abbiamo una visione completamente diversa rispetto alle altre, che è la visione dell'antropologia, che è la visione del, della storia dell'uomo e del confronto dell'uomo con il suo contesto, con dove vive, come vive e come deve affrontare i nodi eh, dell'umanità e eh, ci attendiamo questa sera eh, una grande lezione da parte di Appadurai. Grazie a tutti. Grazie Andrea. Rubo ancora veramente cinque minuti, cercherò di andare più rapida possibile, ma ci premeva che si capisse il contesto di questo incontro, che per noi, come ha detto appunto Andrea, è stato molto importante perché non ci saranno conclusioni, ci sono veramente delle domande che ci possiamo porre e eh, speriamo almeno che ci sia, sia scattata in tutti noi la voglia, la curiosità, l'intelligenza di eh, non, non rimanere sintonizzati e quindi continuare a esplorare per capire. Allora, se mi mandano le, le slide vi faccio benissimo rapidissimamente capire il percorso che ci ha portato stasera a Padurai con il programma Future Ways of Living questo programma ripeto peraltro è sostenuto da partner a cui tengo moltissimo come la Fondazione Fiera di Milano Artemide, la Camera di Commercio di Milano che bisogna ringraziare il Comune di Milano, insomma ci sono varie forze insieme che hanno permesso che Mide Media Guru potesse andare avanti arrivando ovviamente a questo appuntamento così importante e anche importante per noi. Se eh, Fastweb ovviamente allora se mi mettete la slide per cortesia le, del percorso ra, andando rapidissimamente vi rubo veramente due minuti eh, noi siamo partiti come diceva appunto cancellato da quest'idea qua è vero, cioè abbiamo, possiamo fare tutto, abbiamo tutto che cosa però veramente vogliamo fare i nostri personaggi ci hanno sollecitato, ci hanno mandato delle sollecitazioni il primo che, che abbiamo incontrato è stato John Tacara in luogo qui sempre alla triennale Beh, con John Tacara abbiamo affrontato lui ci ha mandato veramente dei messaggi molto interessanti su quella che è la necessità del redesign, quindi di un design non tanto degli oggetti ma di un design che si ritrovi e quindi un concetto di pianificazione, di design sociale, che si ritrovi soprattutto un discorso, un'armonia anche con il tema dell'ambiente, tanto che ha ridisegnato, ha, ha, ha progettato e ha lanciato questa scommessa che si ragioni anche in termini di bioregioni e questo era John Tacara che è inglese ma praticamente un cittadino del mondo. Eh, dopo John siamo passati, perché è stato un po' una sorta di giro del mondo fatto con Mide Media Guru e la triennale, a Mugendi Mrita che è dal Sudafrica, oltretutto lui è presidente del le, quello che una volta si chiamava um, ICSID, eh, quindi la grande associazione del design mondiale, Beh, lui è straordinario perché ha messo l'accento su una parola chiave, empatia, e quindi pensare a progettare nel nuovo però la tradizione inserita nel nuovo e soprattutto in un contesto di progettazione sempre attenta a quello che sono il tema delle soluzioni sociali, tradizione nel nuovo. Sono solo flash eh, perché le loro relazioni sono state ben più ricche, ben più eh, stimolanti di quello che posso sintetizzare io, però mi sembrava importante con voi ripercorrere queste tappe. Con Jonathan Wozel invece siamo andati in Cina, lui è un economista eh, americano ma vive in Cina, è il direttore McKinsey in Cina e Beh, da economista, eh, visto quelle che sono appunto il problema delle grandi città, dei grandi agglomerati, tutte le, le situazioni, diciamo le aberrazioni che si sono create nel giro di pochissimi anni in Cina, adesso c'è tutto un movimento che con appunto il redesign, il design, la pianificazione e una pianificazione anche politica cerca, partendo proprio dal caso di queste grandi megalopoli, di analizzare quelle che possono essere delle soluzioni. Quindi usiamo un po' queste città, queste anche aberrazioni 
situazioni se vogliamo ma come casi da cui poter ripartire per evitare che poi nel mondo si generino altre situazioni così gravi anche in termini ambientali, sociali e quant'altro. Eh, infine Luigi Ferrara è un nome italiano ma è canadese di Toronto, è il rettore della Giorgio Brown College di Toronto e beh, con lui abbiamo affrontato il Museo della Scienza e della Tecnica, un ragionamento molto bello su quello che lui chiama economia della saggezza e il fatto quindi che è importante il design, il design inteso come progettazione, ma anche una riconsiderazione della figura del design che non è più una figura specifica, diceva Luigi, ma dovrebbe essere appunto aperto a 3.000 eh, discipline diverse, cioè una poliedrico eccetera, ma un design che sia un design partecipativo, che sia un design, una progettazione che guarda alle soluzioni, alle soluzioni, della, che, alle soluzioni trovare soluzioni che si pone il problema soprattutto degli effetti, quello mi aveva colpito. Quando progettare fosse anche un, un industrial design, il concetto è quello di tener conto degli effetti, degli effetti nella vita degli individui e negli effetti della società. Quindi cambiamenti di paradigma. E poi abbiamo avuto anche questa sorpresa di poter ospitare Kenny Ara e Andrea Branzi, li ricordo molto volentieri perché la mostra che è qui, chi non l'avesse vista veramente non se la perda, la neo Neopreistoria, il titolo della mostra, beh, questo sembra quasi un titolo che in qualche modo cal calza perfettamente con quelli che sono i tempi attuali, cioè una, una situazione dove non riusciamo a capire il destino, non riusciamo a capirne il senso e, e quindi e poi è una mostra che in realtà la mostra traccia tutta la storia dell'umanità attraverso 100 oggetti e 100 verbi, è, una, è un percorso straordinario, proprio qui al primo piano eh, abbiamo con loro appunto parlato di questa nuova condizione, quindi in sintesi direi che eh, stasera, come diceva appunto anche Andrea, è il momento di affrontare il tema del progetto, della progettazione, della progettazione vista in chiave sociale, eh, con un, un noto antropologo, appunto con Apadurai. Eh, noi alla fine di questo percorso, perché c'è stata anche una summer school, inviterei tutti quanti a vedere una mostra City After the City, fantastica, che è nell'area Expo di Milano, e lì poi vicino c'è anche una mostra, il risultato del lavoro di questa summer school, l'area Expo, eh, abbiamo creato appunto una summer school da cui abbiamo, eh, alla fine pubblicheremo un libro con il risultato del lavoro fatto durante questa scuola estiva, diciamo, con una metodologia molto innovativa canadese e soprattutto raccoglieremo il pensiero, la sintesi di tutti i contributi che ci sono arrivati attraverso questi nostri ospiti così straordinari. Però adesso è il momento dell'ultima puntata, quindi ci risentiremo a ottobre quando sarà pubblicato il libro col Sole 24 Ore, eh, sarete rinvitati tutti, rimanete in contatto, però adesso siamo qua per ascoltare la, la voce, di, eh, la storia e il racconto di Apadurai. Ecco qua. Eh, sapete benissimo che è un noto antropologo, insegna negli Stati Uniti, originario di Mumbai, prego. Ha pubblicato dei libri molto interessanti, tra cui due pubblicati in Italia, da Cortina, Il futuro come fatto culturale è, è, è l'ultimo, ma in realtà ne sta per uscire un altro, e mi sembra proprio in ottobre. La parola, professore. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very honored uh, to be here uh, today in uh, Milan uh, as a guest uh, of the Triennale and of uh, the organizers of this series, uh, Meet the Media Guru. Uh, it's uh, strange for me to think of myself as a guru of anything, uh, uh, including media, but uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, really delighted uh, to be in the city and to be in this uh, institution, uh, which I've had a chance to see some of today, including through the kindness of the Director General, who spoke earlier, and of Maria also, to see uh, a, a little bit of what is on view uh, in these rooms as part of uh, these uh, events Uh, on design after design, and they are beautiful. I'm sure if you don't see some of these exhibits today, you will see them soon. 
uh, and uh, so uh, I'm also uh, thankful and very appreciative of the many people who have been very generous and uh, kind uh, to me today uh, and yesterday and made me very welcome here in Milan and here uh, at the Triennale. Uh, last but not least, before I begin to address uh, the topic of the future, uh, I also want to uh, thank all of you and all of the uh, very uh, enthusiastic uh, younger people who are uh, outside, uh, having not uh, perhaps uh, having arrived more spontaneously. Uh, uh, so all uh, uh, to all of you for making some time uh, this evening to listen to my uh, thoughts. Uh, I'm very grateful. I also look forward to hearing uh, something of your own views during the question and answer uh, period. So let me begin. I do have, uh, being uh, an academic, I, I do have a, a text, but I will try to make it as uh, painless uh, as possible. So the, the lecture, the, the title that I have in my mind and in my text is Futures in the Making. Futures in the Making. And I want to begin, so uh, my plan is as follows, before I begin to speak uh, uh, or read uh, a little bit, uh, to speak for about uh, a half an hour. And I just want to watch myself. I have an almost unreadable watch, but I think it's 10 minutes to 8, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I will uh, speak for about 30 minutes. And then for the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'll very quickly show you some images which I think resonate very much with some of what I've already seen in, in the uh, exhibits in this beautiful building and uh, make some informal remarks about the objects and uh, designs that I will show you just very quickly in the last 10 or 15 minutes. That's the plan. So um, the first uh, introductory thoughts I have uh, are under the subject matter, uh, new tools, new words. And I think the Director General will recognize why I was so excited by the 100 words that I just saw, because words are very much on my mind. So one remarkable feature of our emerging material world is that it is accompanied by a change in our linguistic world. Many words from our past have been repurposed to signal new meanings, and these linguistic changes themselves constitute a map of our changing times. Examples of such change are in such ordinary words as mining, code, user, printing, searching, and liking. Mining is a key word in the world of big data and refers to the technologies and protocols used to scan large data sets to discern new patterns of behavior, preference, and interest among large populations. That one of the words to describe this method uh, of pattern recognition is the one that humans have long used to describe the extraction of precious metals uh, from the Earth's depths points us to the fact that mining still has to do with the unearthing of value by extracting, refining, and sifting through raw materials and still involves putting human misery at the service of profit. Data mining, the form of mining that is most vital to our emerging technologies, is indeed both exploitative and profit-oriented, but the technologies through which it works appear often to be clean, transparent, and democratic. Yet, the persistence of the word mining should keep us alert to the older sense of the word. Code is another such word. Once used to refer to any linguistic form that underlies another one, it gradually has begun to be associated with secrecy, encryption, warfare, and espionage. Today, across spaces such as computer science, genetics, cryptography, and programming, 
in general, it has acquired a neutral, professional, and benign quality. But the truth is that all coding involves specialized knowledge of languages, algorithms, and protocols, which is intended to be invisible to the ordinary user, unavailable to competitors, and resistant to cracking or hacking. So codes and coding are also becoming a part of our linguistic environment, but there are new meanings. Their new meanings may hide older problems and risks. User is an even more commonplace part of our emerging linguistic worlds, and it is another word which had simpler meanings in the past and referred to certain forms of value, use value, and to this basic role, uh, and to the basic role of utility in human life. But today we are all users of tools, apps, and devices which define major parts of our humanity and sociality. Here again, what this linguistic change indicates is the colonization of large parts of our lives by rules of function, utility, and convenience, which have gradually begun to define our views of our lives in larger ways. Our cities, our institutions, our politics, our policies, and our collective values are increasingly defined by such qualities as smartness, speed, and connectivity, rather than by values such as inclusiveness, equity, or justice. The everyday habit of seeing ourselves as users is the linguistic edge of this process. It is easy to see how the technologically induced transformation of such words as printing to describe, for example, 3D production, reproduction, searching as defined by Google, and liking as normalized by Facebook follows a similar logic in which old meanings are both invoked and subverted by new devices and protocols. This logic can also be extended to such basic terms as identity, now often seen as a vulnerable form of intellectual property that can be stolen, and privacy now mainly seen as a target of machinic surveillance. These linguistic examples can be multiplied, and they are in some ways a natural part of all periods of rapid technological change. But in our times, new meanings are so quickly circulated and naturalized as to make their changed implications seem minor, even though they have fundamental implications for our humanity, our sociality, and our solidarity. Such linguistic changes are part and parcel of subtle cultural shifts in regard to scale, visibility, and individuality, each of which I will talk about briefly. Scale, visibility, individuality. So the transformation of scale, the future emerging through design, which is part of what this whole series, I believe, is about, demands a new way of thinking about scale in our lives as human beings. Scale has always been an important dimension of human life, and in prior eras, smallness and bigness had predictable relationships in regard to increasing size, distance, connectivity, and materiality. Above all, the scales of time and space had a relatively hierarchical connection in which nearness in space and time meant greater access and familiarity, and remoteness meant less knowledge and control. That hierarchy is now no longer something we can take for granted. Scanning, sensing, screening, and reading have made the scales irregular, and smallness and nearness have collapsed into more obscure qualities due to the ubiquity of mediation and the saturation of our intimate spaces by big data, electronic connectivity, and mobile applications. Telephony, mobility, and multi-use personal devices have collapsed the boundaries between our bodies and our applications and devices for self-surveillance of our location, our health, our fitness, and our finances, self-surveillance. These have made our bodies increasingly into nodes in complex, large-scale communication 
uh, into, uh, in a complex large-scale communication and data gathering universe. At the same time, new developments in robotics and biomedicine, along with various social applications, have extended our bodies through prostheses, proxies, and electronic persona so as to allow them to extend themselves remotely. These developments, and many others, have upset the traditional relationship between small and big, near and far, here and there, so that scales are now cross-linked outside the architecture of nesting or hierarchical orders. So much for scale. Now I talk briefly about visibility and invisibility. Although the professional and ideological worlds of contemporary design are aggressively secular, they are marked by utopian urges, and thus they share something with the ethos of religion in prior times. Among other things, religion has always been about ways to understand and manage the relationship between the visible and the invisible worlds. And for years, people like me who have to teach classes in the anthropology of religion have always had a struggle. How do you define religion? There's so much variation. So many gods, so many worships, so much ritual. What do you do with all this variation? How do you use a word, single word like religion? Uh, lately, in my uh, senior years, so to speak, I have uh, come to see that religion really, above all, is about the visible and the invisible. So this is my understanding now. So human beings are always aware that their lives are deeply affected by invisible forces. Cosmologies and theologies seek to account for the ways that invisible forces shape visible realities. Magic and ritual help human beings to negotiate this boundary. The future that is emerging through our new designs changes the nature of the negotiation between the visible and the invisible orders. One side of this negotiation is the screen. The screen on our laptops, our Kindles, our iPhones, and our iPads, and many other things. These screens now set the conditions in which we shape our lives as users, as citizens, as consumers, and as friends. We rely on our screens to keep us in social contact, to learn about the news, the weather, the stock market, and to play games, listen to music, and order taxis. The screen as an interface defines the site today where the visible meets the invisible or becomes visible. As we develop new platforms, new servers, new tools, and new apps, the interface becomes the place where the world becomes visible, manageable, and available to us. So this word interface is another of these old words. It has a kind of routine sound. Well, there's an interface here and there. Now I would say it's a loaded, cosmological, ontological world. It's the place where the negotiation happens between the visible and invisible orders. And as this interface becomes more complex and more ubiquitous, we are becoming used to the new landscape of clouds, data mining, information farms, and the like. And we begin, begin to regard them as new forms of nature, which are also becoming second nature to us. As we play, socialize, and dream through the interface, new ideas of well-being, uncertainty, community, and humanity are gradually becoming part and parcel of our common sense. From this perspective, the future emerging through design is a sort of religious future, although it appears in the guise of technology. So much for visibility and invisibility. I move quickly now to individuality, third term that I think is part of this word, world where new words and new tools are changing everything around us. Individuality. More striking about the new materialities that shape the design of our emerging futures is that they may be changing the very bedrock of Western modernity the category of the individual, that package of agency, value, motivation, personality, and choice that underlies our most common and taken for granted ideas about knowledge, justice, freedom, and sociality. 
other societies in human history have had different ways to see the distribution of agency in, and personhood in the cosmos, and have seen human beings as only one crystallization among many that define agentive diversity. So actually, it's now clearer and clearer among anthropologists and philosophers that our idea of the individual is just a very recent, very specialized development in a world which where if you look around, and anthropologists are always looking around, this idea of where is agency, where is energy, where is motivation, is very diverse. And this so-called individual, the human individual, is only one kind of momentary crystallization. Often, human societies, other human societies, have seen themselves as what some of my colleagues call individual, not individual, but individual, something smaller, less stable. Temporary assemblages of matter and meaning, quick to change in the process of interacting with other individuals, which may be human or not. They could be animals, they could be tools, they could be machines, they could be gods, all were individuals in some interactions. So this individual is, I'm trying to say, a kind of special, strange thing. That sort of individual, not individual, may be emerging again in our times with machinic protocols that divide us, divide us, chop us up into attributes of wealth, race, location, taste, or class, so as to better determine our suitability for credit, insurance, educational assistance, welfare, or something I'll come to in a minute, refugee status. Contemporary design also does not rely much on the classic individual, seen as a permanent repository of rights, capacities, and obligations, but is mostly oriented to individuals, clusters of tastes, locations, and biographies, which can be combined and recombined to create large, larger aggregations or patterns for the purposes of market states or other large agencies. So I've recently written uh, a small book uh, about the financial crisis of 07, 08, which as many of you know, especially in the US, involved the banking sector, and particularly involved mortgages, home mortgages. But when you study these home mortgages carefully, what you begin to see is something where the individual mortgage, which is connected to me or my family and my house, is actually a piece of paper that's been uh, uh, transformed so the individual mortgage can be cut up conceptually, and let's say the mortgages of this whole room, several hundred mortgages, can be cut up and recombined, put in a kind of economic blender, and all of a sudden there is a bundle. That bundle is then sold. The man who buys it, or the bank that buys it, can chop it up again, sell it again. This is the key to the relationship between something very real, which is the home, and the mysteries of derivatives in finance. What is derivative? Something derived from something else. But the thing is, it's not just derivation. It's not just, uh, I'm a banker, I see a mortgage, I sell that mortgage to somebody else. I'm cutting, slicing, chopping, recombining, repackaging, and selling again. With new risk, new value, there's a kind of mysterious process here. But above all, the mortgage is a very good example of the splitting up into smaller parts and their re-aggregation into big packages that at the end of the day, the mortgage industry and the financial industry related to housing has almost nothing to do with individual homeowners, their homes, their hopes, their aspirations, their security, their physical shelter, etc. It's a pure concept. Uh, simply blending, moving, changing, and re-aggregating. Where is the individual of this? Well, very far away. Thus, invariably <coughs> and inevitably, the social is also changing its meanings and no longer indicates contractually organized, permanent, and well-defined groupings of individuals, but is now a constantly shifting array of individuals 
who can briefly connect through technological devices and affordances, but is no longer easy to unite in terms of such older categories as class, community, locality, or ethnicity. So in the old days, that was possible. Because we were individuals. We had some permanence and so on, or so we thought. Now that we have been sliced and diced by the financial industry and by many other industries, the medical industry, the insurance industry, the, the, uh, the uh, educational industry, because at least in the US, thank God, I don't think this is yet big in Europe, there is no higher education without loans. Student means debt. Student equals debt. And that debt is constantly also cut up, sliced, repackaged, and moved, and sold again and again and again. So education does not exist in the US outside of debt. And that is a very similar process where it has nothing much to do with your individuality, your hope, your career, your discipline, your field, your aspirations. It has to do with how much did you borrow? <laughs> and who do you repay through your whole lifetime? And what happens to that wealth and that repayment and who is taking the higher top value out of that? That is all affected by this kind of slicing and, and dicing. So, I've talked very briefly about scale, visibility, invisibility, and now about something very basic, which is the individual, the very bedrock of our social thought in the modern West. Take away the idea of the individual, and all of you who are uh, studying in the university or who are dealing with social issues know that it's very difficult to do anything else. If you pull the rug out from individual, what are you going to do? This, in my view, I say this as an aside, is why people on the progressive left find it very difficult to mobilize people in terms of class interest and position and so on because individuals have been sliced up. They, no longer, they, are, they are in pieces. Paul Vere, as one of my friends told me about it, crushed and, and distributed. So, so that is why you can't mobilize people easily these days. It is also why, and this is another aside, there is a great appeal to right-wing ideologies worldwide. Donald Trump in Italy, all the names you know on the far right, uh, in Austria, in Germany, in Sweden, but also in China and Russia, in my country, India. The swing to the right is truly global. And I'm not even talking of the dictators and tyrants and so on. I'm talking of all kinds of so-called democratic leaders are increasingly on the right. The reason why that appeal exists, I think, has something to do with the destruction or dissolution of the old idea of the individual, and that people are now, therefore, nostalgic for a world in which individuals existed. And what xenophobia does is to give them the feeling we are still there. That world is still available. The truth is, that world is gone. The horse is out of the barn. We have to build a different type of politics based on our current realities. We cannot look back and say, gee, how bad that was. Can we go back to the 19th century when people were real individuals and we had a social contract and we met our obligations to each other? It would be nice. But that world is gone. So, I began by indicating that old words are acquiring new meanings in our technology-driven and designed futures. I also suggested that this linguistic change is the symptom of a deeper set of cultural changes in such domains as scale, visibility, and individuality. I do not mean to be alarmist or to indicate that we're entering some sort of design dystopia. Rather, I suggest alertness. We should all be alert to the tectonic shifts beneath our new conveniences, affordances, and utilities. Without such alertness, we will become victims of the volatility of the new world of designed futures rather than its masters. This is a high stakes moment, and I would now like to make a, a shift to talk about why do I say this is a high stakes moment? Because you could turn and say, look, you know, whenever there's a big technological change, everything changes, people get worried, they're anxious, and then one century later, everybody's happy. We no longer are uh, longing for the world when we were using plows and doing farming. We are fine, industry happened, it's great. 
So isn't this like that? Why am I so worried? Well, I'm worried because we are in a high stakes moment. And I want to say briefly something about this high stakes moment. And I will say it informally because I have a longer uh, view of this. But the comments that I'm about to make, uh, on which I will take another uh, five or 10 minutes and then move to the images, concern something which is very much on everybody's mind in Europe, in Italy, but also everywhere else in Europe. And that, of course, is the uh, migrant crisis or immigration crisis or refugee crisis, whatever it's called, which is, of course, on everybody's mind. And I have a few things to say about it, which I hope are not simply things you all know well, because everybody here is reading the papers, is making analyses, is getting information, is trying to make intelligent uh, decisions about what to do with this new arrival of people, especially from North Africa uh, and, and, and the Muslim Middle East to uh, the shores of Europe and to all its countries, right up to the Scandinavian, from Greece right up to Scandinavia. So I don't want to repeat the facts you know, nor do I want to repeat to you uh, uh, something which in this room I'm sure requires no repetition, that we would all like to be open we would all like to be generous, we would all like to be compassionate, we would all like to be inclusive, but we are also worried. What are these incidents in Munich and Paris and France and I'm sure in different parts of Italy over the last few years or even over the last decade? We can't deny we are worried. What do we do in this circumstance? And I have no great solutions, uh, nor do I want to repeat the things we all agree on, that we wish things were better, we wish we could be accommodating, we wish we could do this and that. I, I want to say something slightly different, which is why I regard this as a very high stakes moment and why I regard this as a potentially very creative moment, even though it looks very frightening and very uh, challenging and it looks beyond our capacity to handle. So I want to make two kinds of observations, again very briefly and I hope in the Q&A I can say a bit more. The first is that I think this new wave of migrants, which is humans in movement, or humans in crisis motion who arrive at our shores and for whom we are fundamentally unprepared. And I say we now speaking from a European perspective. These are also people who have been pushed out, if you like, against their will from places like Syria, which have truly fallen apart. Uh, and we cannot forget that. They're not simply moving you know, because they made a decision to move yesterday. They're moving out of places that have become unlivable. Uh, and they're arriving here. So people are in motion, but I want to notice two other things. One is people are in motion and people are now in crisis movement, but we also have two other kinds of movement that I think we need to think about at the same time as we think about how to think about refugees and migration. One is the movement of objects. And I think this topic is very important, particularly for museums, particularly for museums concerned with the material world, and particularly, let's say, for a design project. Because what is design about if it's not about things, objects, tools, physical things? But all museums, whether they're art museums, archaeological museums, whether it's a British, British museum or a tiny folk museum somewhere in, uh, in Tuscany, all of them live on objects. And in many, many, many cases, especially for important large museums in every country in Europe, but also in the US uh, and in other parts of the West, objects that are in museums have a story. And mostly that story is a story of imperialism, conquest, illegal appropriation, and buying and selling, which is not legal. We all know this, of course. This is not, I'm not telling anybody any news. Some museums are better about being honest about this. Others simply deny it. But by and large, museums are sitting on objects that I call accidental refugees. Those objects also arrived, not exactly by choice. They were removed and restored. But by and large, although those of you in the museum world here may correct me, my impression 
is that when these objects, even by the most thoughtful people in the museum world and the arts world and so on, are put on display, whether they are huge statues or tiny jewels or metals or textiles or fabric, anything, it is very rare that the story of their journey is told. What is told is what they teach us about their place and time. This is an object from Assyria from the third century. This is from uh, India in, in the period of the Buddha, and so on and so forth. I'm not against this. I do think this is good. But how the hell did it come here? And why is that story not part of the story that every museum tells? I would say, tell it. It's not that today we, we did something criminal, but we have these things. So why not tell that story? It's a, it's a difficult thing to tell. Obviously difficult for moral reasons, different for ethical reasons, legal reasons, political reasons. But I think it's a very important story to tell. And there is a reason why it's very important, and that is that I have devoted a large part of my life going back very early to 1986 when I edited a collection of essays called The Social Life of Things. Some of you may have read this book. It's kind of an old book now, 1986. It's almost 30 years. It's scary. Uh, but my observation then, which now many people take for granted as, well, of course, it's obvious, but it was not so obvious then, is that objects and people are not radically different. Objects, in that book, our major conceit of me and the other authors was objects also have stories. Objects have biographies. Objects are born. Objects live. Objects die. Objects circulate. Objects speak, etc., etc. So in many ways, they are like us. And of course, in many societies in the world, objects were seen as having very animate power. They were seen as capable of movement, not as dead and different from us. Today, by the way, people like my distinguished colleague Bruno Latour and many other people, Isabel Stengers and so on and so forth, the so-called new materialists, have rediscovered some of these ideas through Spinoza and so on, that everything is kind of moving. This thing is moving. This cup is moving. It looks still, and I look like I'm moving alone, but the truth is, there's a lot of purposive energy around us in the cosmos, in nature, of course in animals and so on, but also in planets, in rocks, in metals. These are all living, breathing things. Today, that insight is slowly coming back, that objects, things, and people are not fundamentally different. They may be different in an, at the extreme, but in much of life, they all are moving around, shaping each other, telling stories, speaking or not speaking, active or inactive, and so on. This is now a very common observation among philosophers, designers, scientists, and sociologists of science. All of them are saying, look around you. This is a highly animated world. So what I'm saying is not radical in that way, but it means that circulating objects also should be treated in a way like migrants or refugees whose story needs to be told. So if you think of refugees today, by and large, we don't really, we do the opposite with people that we do with things. With them, we are always telling how they came. They came from here, they came in the sea, they crossed this border, they did this illegal thing, they went under this boundary, they took this, this, they did that. But we don't tell the other side of who they are, what they may have been, or what they may wish to be. It's all about how did they get here. Was it legal, illegal, and so on? And that, of course, there is a reason for that. And the reason for that is that, above all, migrants, refugees who have not been invited raise profound questions about some other topic, which I've also been interested in for decades, which is national sovereignty, territory, identity, citizenship, all of which, for us, is contained in the idea of the nation state. So I think refugees articulate that problem, and I don't need to tell you that that is a European problem which would exist with or without refugees. What is Italy? What is Brussels? Who is Germany? Are we really together? Why did Britain leave? These are questions that don't require Syrians or Iraqis to make them issues. They are issues already in Europe. I don't think they are impossible issues, but they are issues. So 
The third circulation, so objects and people are moving. We need to think about that together. The third thing which is moving is the euro, currency. Currency is moving around, and I said earlier to some of the people with whom I spoke, uh, uh, journalists and friends in the media, that uh, it has not been enough notice that the refugee crisis of the last year was only six or eight months after the euro crisis. And the countries that face the front line of the refugee crisis, Greece particularly, but also Italy, also Spain, to some extent the Central European countries, the very ones that are facing directly the arrival of mostly unwanted migrants are the same people who faced debt, austerity, and financial discipline. It is not controversial anymore to say that Greece has no national sovereignty left. Greece is a wholly owned subsidiary of the EU, the IMF, at the World Bank. Greece does not exist as an economic entity. Now, that may seem a shocking statement until I make another shocking statement, which I also said to some people informally earlier today. No nation has a national economy anymore. This is the big scandal of our times. There is no national economy. There is no national economy in Cameroon, in Niger, in the poorest countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and there is no national economy in the US, Canada, the wealthiest countries, Sweden, Nobody owns the economy. This is a big embarrassment. What was the nation state about? It was above all about something called the national economy. Now there is no national economy. So what are you going to govern over? All you are going to govern over is free speech, dissent, borders, information, data. Because the biggest thing of all, you have no control. It's gone. That is globalization. So. The euro crisis is a crisis of circulation in money, which is a special object, along with the circulation of people and of things. So my proposal is, has two parts, and I will end this part with very quickly saying what my idea is. My idea is, first of all, that all of us need to think about these circulations together, not separate the migrant problem and the human problem, from the object problem and the currency problem. All are moving. The second thing is that the nation state, the European nation state, especially the more powerful, relatively wealthy and well-off ones, and you have to tell me where Italy might fit on this. It's clearly not the poorest European nation, nor is it the wealthiest European nation. But if you take Germany, about which I'm thinking a lot these days, I would say Germany, and maybe many other European countries, maybe including Italy, have a chance to reinvent what the nation state is about. And here is my metaphor for what I think the European nation state could become. Rather than being about territorial sovereignty, borders, policing, surveillance, and control, with insiders and outsiders, I think I have an idea, which I'm slowly trying to write about for Europe as a whole, which is the state could become, the nation state could become what I call a curatorial state. Behave as a curator, a term that comes from the museum world and not accidentally. Be a trustee or a steward of objects of wealth and of people who are temporarily in the custody of the nation state. Temporarily, may not be tomorrow may not be 50 years from now, but now in your custody. So I'm opening up the idea that we don't have to give up the nation state, but maybe we can move from an idea of territorial sovereignty, control, and exclusion to a kind of curatorial idea. That things are always moving. They'll never be with us forever. But while they are with us, maybe we can make their presence dignified, valuable, included in our social worlds. So I'm going to simply stop there and re remind you that when I said we are living in an age of new words, new visibility, new scales, new relationships created by design, but I also said it's a moment, not only a dystopian moment, it's a moment of opportunity. And this example that the nation state can somehow reinvent itself, I think is an example of that kind of possibility which is hiding in the present crisis in Europe. Now, I'm old enough to know that this is not the kind of idea that will be embraced either in Brussels or on the far right, all of whom have other ideas of the nation state. But I think it's our obligation as an 
this series to design new possibilities, to come up with new ideas. So I'm now going to very quickly, if my technology, which I've been given a lot of help with, does not fail me, show you some images very quickly, all familiar things relatively, but which tell us something about uh, the world that we are entering. So let me see if this works, if I can hit this. I've hit a button in the hope, ah, okay. So very quickly, this is Apple's headquarters. I just want to just absorb these images and I'll make a few comments and then I'll stop. Uh, how do I make it move? The same black button, I wonder? Or, or do I have to point it somewhere? Ah, the Aquila drone. This is a Facebook produced image. Knew this would happen. One second, patience. Is this what I press to keep it moving? This one. Yeah. Next is in backwards. Yeah. Next is not working so, so well for me. Ah. So which button do I hit for next? Okay. Let's hit the next and see if it comes. It doesn't work. That is not working. Okay. So we will. Uh, I will tell you it's the opposite. One picture says a thousand words, but I won't give you a thousand words. I will tell you that the images I have are images very much like those that are on exhibit here in different parts of this museum. There's a, a robot, for example, beautiful Berkeley designed robot, which does all your dirty clothes. But it not only goes, collects the dirty clothes, brings them together, washes them, dries them, and irons them with seven or eight arms. I have it right in front of me. Uh, there is something which shows you how Bitcoin, the new currency, works. There is the greatest single piece of technology, at least for my purposes. Ah, OK. Great. So of course, I've lost track of what this is. So yeah, will this work better? So this will move it. OK, great. And to move it back, the red one, let's see. Yeah, OK. So we have more hope now. So this uh, is a, I want to come, uh, not to dwell on these images too long, but to come to, uh, yeah. So this is ARCID 100, something to do with planetary surveillance for ecological purposes, not security purposes. This is a little home lab for becoming your own student and scientist of DNA and so on in the privacy of your own home. This is the robot that I mentioned, our dream, which will do everything, including folding your clothes. Uh, this is called a Bitcoin miner. This is how the Bitcoin currency, this is part of the technology of Bitcoin. This, my favorite, is what? The Bloomberg Terminal, the beating heart of the global finance machine. Estonian residence card, fully biometric, and so on. Fitbit, so we now all self-survey our health, our jogging, our heartbeat, our circulation. Uh, this is a Greek referendum paper. A little... Uh, uh, it's called ISS Presso Machine by Lavazza, <laughs> an Italian product. This is another piece of uh, domestic technology. This is a crowd-funded bridge, looked single. Uh, and this is another picture of that same bridge. 3D uh, Switzerland, I believe. 3D printed objects, of which we saw something uh, in this building earlier. Uh, a 3D printer. This is one of these incredible new cities in the, in the Gulf, Hasdar City. This is perhaps my favorite. This is the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. This is a hologram. So this man who is... Uh, 
uh, a far right guy, in many ways quite scary, is also extremely smart with new technologies and how to represent and present himself. This is a hologram of Modi created by his media advisors, which he uses very effectively, though he has a very limited education. He is not a sophisticated tech guy, but he has a very smart instinct for the new technologies. Some kind of weird Google parachute used for exploration and environmental work. This is another small medical object, a scanner for health purposes. Uh, some kind of new uh, bed technology. And here is Antanas Bokus, very different image from, from uh, Narendra Modi, but also performing politics. Uh, so I have other images, but I'm going to stop here and make only one or two comments about this array of, little array of emerging objects, images, representations. And the point I want to make is that they always point in two directions. One of which is convenience, cheapness, availability, and so on and so forth. The other is surveillance, exploitation, profit. And uh, these things now um, surround us in our everyday lives, in our politics, in our citizenship, in our idea of who we are, in our idea of how we found out, find out who we are, how we relate these screen-based realities to other realities. All of these are involved in these new technologies. But I do believe that these technologies do not announce themselves ethically. They have to be somehow appropriated, interpreted, mobilized, and turned to certain purposes, because otherwise, left to themselves, they will drift not only towards surveillance, terror, violence, <clears throat> but to something much more frightening, which also came up in a conversation earlier today, convenience. And I believe that the scariest feature of our contemporary design world is that convenience as a norm that underlies all of what we do is now overriding even utility, function, form, all of that is becoming history. We live now in a world where convenience is becoming our central rallying cry. Whether it's Uber or this or that, it's apps, it's social apps, it's convenience. Now, I invite you to ask what, how we should live in a world in which convenience is becoming the central virtue. And I remind you that hand, the handling, the humane and compassionate and generous handling of something like the refugee crisis or the Euro crisis is going to be an inconvenient affair. So we cannot become habituated to the ideology of convenience. It will not serve us well in the most important crises we face. So I will stop there with many thanks to you for your patience. Credo che ci siano molte domande. Eh, grazie per questo intervento così intenso e appassionato e appassionante. Gli spunti sono molti, quindi possiamo far correre velocemente il microfono qui in sala piuttosto che ricevere delle domande. Prego. Una domanda qua. Stefana Broadman. Hello, my name is Stefana Broadbent. Thank you for the best talk I've heard in a very, very long time. Thank you. May I ask you to expand on, I think, what was the most interesting idea, which was the idea of a curatorial approach to the nation state? Yes. Because you, you, you went through quite quickly. So if you had some more um, ideas on it, thank you. Sure, I'll try to say a bit more. I'll, I'll tell you very honestly, this is a very recent idea. And it's an idea that's coming up in my uh, having spent more time uh, recently in Germany, in Berlin in particular. And I'm going to spend the whole of the coming year in Berlin. So Germany is on my mind, uh, generally in a very positive way, but also wondering what the future will bring to Germany in itself and Germany as a part of Europe. 
And in Germany, I think you may know and others here may know of this extraordinary project called the Humboldt Forum, which is transforming the center of Berlin. It's the largest single cultural project in Europe, 650 million euros, if I'm not mistaken, partly Berlin city money, uh, the Berlin, uh, the state, the regional state, the federal government, and others. It's massive. And it's a project to bring many museums in Berlin into one place in the center of Berlin, which is a very large area. And so it's collecting the uh, objects from ethnographic collections, classical collections, cultural collections, art collections into one major site. So it's very controversial, but it's also somewhat opaque. People don't know what's happening, exactly what is the plan. It's been going for some years. So that has been on my mind and then along comes the Euro crisis, the refugee crisis. So in my mind, all these things began to get uh, mixed up. And so I see that Germany um, is in a remarkable position. And as we all know, uh, Chancellor Merkel took a, a very courageous and compassionate position on the refugees, which was in contrast to her position uh, on Greece and so on in relation to the Euro crisis. This is all well known. But it struck me that Germany, because it happens to be now, and we know things were very different in the past and maybe different in the future, but today, a very wealthy, relatively liberal, and relatively positive force in Europe. Uh, so my question was, how can the wealth of cultural resources, as well as of the migrants arriving, as well of, uh, as economic resources in Germany be turned in some interesting direction. And the choice from the right is, of course, to close the borders, seal it, keep German wealth to itself, and so on and so forth, not pay for the problems of others, etc. The other option, and because I've been thinking about the nation state now for 20 or 30 years, is it going to stay? Is it going to survive? What form will it take? It struck me that there is an option to take up this idea of being a curatorial state, that is, a state which recognizes that what it has within its reach is something which it is holding on behalf of some bigger world, maybe Europe, maybe the Middle East, maybe the whole world, that it is in temporary custody of wealth, currency, and people, all of which it has a responsibility to, but not a response is simply to control, classify, extract, tax, and discipline in the sense that older states did, but perhaps to take care of. And take care of, for me, curatorship means also learning, education, and dignity, whether it's for money or for people or for objects, allowing them to tell a rich story, taking good care of them, treating them with dignity, increasing what you know through them rather than hiding things about them, and so on and so forth. So this is an opening for me, and it's still very much in process, to also expand what the curator should be, and the uh, also in the hope of expanding what the state could be. So that's roughly the line of my thinking, but it's very early stages in my thought. Una domanda, mm. Dr. Bassetti. Well, you, you finished with conveniency. You never mentioned values. Values. Yes. Apparently, in the last part of your of answer, you were referring to values. So I would like, where do you place the scale of values yeah. in the scale of conveniences? So, thank you, uh, Piero Bassetti, who's a, a very distinguished citizen of Milan, whom I'm meeting now for the second time. Uh, a very important question. Uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, let's say, underline that word, but it's very much on my mind. And in uh, a book that uh, is very closely connected to this series, <coughs> which came out in 2013, <coughs> which I think is also now in Italian, on the future as a, as a cultural fact, I contrast two things which are still very much on my mind. What I call the ethics of probability versus the ethics of Possibility. So that's one entry for me into the zone of values. That we, ethics, of course, is not a meaningful word unless you have values. So for me, we are living in a world that could become saturated by probability. Number, likelihood, expectation, control, management, and so on. Exactly. 
For me, possibility is something else. It's something more qualitative. It's about imagination. It's about creativity. It's about all the things uh, I value. Now, I don't want to say, let us remove probability. Let us forget numbers and so on. So because that is an extreme position. It's unrealistic. It's unhealthy. But I do think that the guiding value should be possibility. And for me, possibility as a value is tied to hope, aspiration, and the good life. The only thing I bring to that which is not or very familiar uh, in saying that is what I endorse is to say as an anthropologist that images of a good life are very diverse. And our challenge is to recognize that the person in front of me may have a different and legitimate image of what is health, what is wealth, what is mortality, and so on and so forth. And that we need an open negotiation between these images of the good life. So it's not only a battle between good images of good life and people who want to do bad things, kill others, and so on. It is within this diversity of images of the possible, of the good, that we also need to have a powerful and healthy dialogue. That is where diversity will prove to be either sustainable or unsustainable. Can we negotiate with each other about the good? We can agree on the bad, but can we negotiate on the good? So somewhere along these lines, Piero, is where my thinking about values comes. But it is on my mind. I, I definitely uh, have, in the end, some idea, for example, that diversity is a limitless good. I believe this. I believe there is no such thing as too much diversity, whether of languages, ideas, designs, tools. Let there be more. I've never seen a society suffer because it had too many good ideas, or too much beauty, or too much. So for me, those are value commitments. They're not, uh, shall we say, technocratic commitments or policy commitments. They may come from there, but the source is let's say, a value about diversity. Uh, I hope that at least adds something to our ongoing dialogue. C'è stata una grande conversazione in rete, siamo diventati... Grazie. Siamo diventati trending topic anche stasera. C'è una domanda dalla rete prima di passare qui al signore? One minute. Una domanda dalla rete? Voce. dalla rete sì? eh, ci arriva dagli amici che ci seguono no, da in Perugia inglese, in inglese Lorenzo sì. the question is Mr. Parai, Mr. Parai do you think there the are some words we can use to define the scape that technical tools are creating for us some new words uh, uh, I missed a little bit of your question so uh, uh, could you just say it quickly again? Sure. The, the question is from Perugia, and yeah. they are asking if, there, in your opinion, we can use new words to define the landscape that technical tools, such as social networks, are generating for our society. Yeah, so uh, I think... Uh, I have no uh, commitment uh, or no special uh, case to make that every time we have something new, an application, a tool, a convenience, etc., that we need a new word. I, I, I believe that words should have long lives, that the dictionary tells us that words can have many meanings, that the oldest and richest languages add meanings, they don't give up words. This is all okay. Uh, but I do think it, we are facing a problem when some of the changes in our worlds are masked by the continuity of words. That is why in my own scholarly career, I have sometimes made new words, not uh, like ethnoscape or something like that, not because I thought there's something fun about making new words, it's not a game, but because a new word sometimes can disturb creatively and unsettle our point of view, and especially unsettle our common sense. Common sense is the hardest thing to change because it is common. It seems natural. 
says, of course this is a, of course I will die for the nation state. Well, why would you? Exactly. Uh, so this naturalness, this commonsensical idea, when important words about important things acquire that sense of common sense, which also masks critical thought, then I think it's time for new words. Now, I don't have many in my current supply, although uh, I would say the idea of the curatorial state is a way to slightly shake people up, because there will be a lot of people who say, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, what do you mean, the state is curator? You're confusing design and museums with politics and with uh, real politics and so on. That, but that's what I want to do. I want to say, why not? Uh, of course, many people will dismiss it. That is the way with things. Uh, but if a few people listen, or pay attention, or give it some thought, it could be very helpful. So that's an example of a, uh, not a new word, but I would say a new context for an old word, which is curatorship. I hope that helps. Grazie. Ancora una domanda? Prego, se si presenta. Yes. It, uh, Nand Kumar, uh, so it was very nice to hear a new analogy, analogy regarding the movement of objects, people, and currency together. Now, I want to go a bit deep into it. The movement of objects had happened between the beginning of 18th century till the middle of 20th century, whereas movement of people has been mainly because of the political crisis during World War or during partition in 1947 in Asia yes, or yes. during the last two decades from Africa and now in, recently from Syria into Europe. So how these different movements at different time frames of objects and the movement of people, which is also in different time frames, can be linked together? Uh, it's a wonderful question. It's a good, uh, it's, it's an important question too. I would say that the recency of migration, partition in India and so on, it, it, it sometimes blinds us to the fact that people have been moving for a long time. And that has created disturbances also for a long time. But actually, the historical commonality in the time scale, the historical commonality is that the movement of people across national borders became a special problem after the nation, modern nation state was invented, which is roughly the same three centuries as the modern nation state moved into the world, conquering, collecting objects, bringing them back to Europe, creating the Wunderkammers, and so on and so forth, which is the prehistory of the modern museum, is very closely tied up to the 300 to 400 year history post the Treaty of Westphalia of the nation state. So I would say the story of why migrants create new anxieties is when you have an idea of a territory which has a boundary and so on, because as many scholars, including me, have pointed out, in the older world, when before the nation state, when you had empires and so on, they were concerned about the center. They didn't care about the edge. Genghis Khan didn't care where his territory ended. It ended in some open zone, you know. It, it was what the geographers called a frontier, not a boundary. So I think, in fact, that the migrant crisis, though of course it has recent issues in it, terrorism, this and that, is not so recent an issue and has some historical link uh, to the question of objects and even to the question of modern monetary forms central banking, all of them have a history of a few hundred years, which when you scratch it, begins to be connected to the idea of the modern nation state, what its reach is, what it should do, and so on. Which all of these kinds of circulation disturb that. And I think a lot of our attention comes from that disturbance. So that's roughly the line of my thinking. But I thank you for your question. Grazie. È difficile adesso chiudere, ce lo siamo detti prima con il direttore della Triennale che eh, Future Ways on Living chiude un ciclo quest'anno, eh, ci ritroveremo per il libro. Io volevo ringraziare tantissimo il nostro ospite a Padurai, che le facciamo veramente ancora un applauso che si merita perché comunque ci ha dato degli spunti da un Twitter che è arrivato... A Padurai, due punti, non siamo in un momento distopico ma di grande creatività, a noi il coraggio di cambiare e creare nuove idee, future ways. Se andate sul sito troverete tutto il dialogo, il dibattito che c'è stato durante la lezione, durante la, 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 sì, la lezione, la lecture di Mr. Padurai e restiamo sintonizzati perché 
il, me il messaggio è continuiamo a indagare, a ragionare, a cercare di cogliere, di applicare le parole che appunto Padurai, l'invito che Padurai ci fa è quello di chiedersi, di guardare e di cercare di sintonizzarsi, di capire questo grande momento di cambiamento e di creatività se vogliamo. So che ci sono tantissime altre domande ma il tempo è quello che è, tiranno, grazie per essere stato qui con noi, ancora grazie a voi anche a tutti gli amici che hanno seguito fino adesso il dibattito dal piano sotto. Prego, grazie. Stiamo sintonizzati. Grazie.